Hey everybody, I'm Chris Hastings, executive producer for World Channel. Thank you for joining us for this special Meet the Maker event. I'm here with a very special guest, Sharetta Brundage, who uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, through Twitter. Um, Sharetta, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It is um, my time. It is Autism Awareness Month. Um, you know, I've got three kids on the spectrum and, you know, this used to be the month where I would get depressed or sad or, you know, think about all the parents with normal developing children and, you know, just get into a funk. But, you know, now I use this as an opportunity to celebrate my uh, three special needs children. Well, let, let's 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 dig into that. You know, like I've met you on Twitter and I joke about it. I've literally met you on Twitter because of a literally, film, yeah, literally because of a film release on Fannie Lou Hamer. And I met you and, and you know how you meet somebody on Twitter, you start digging into it. And with you, there were layers upon layers upon layers. And I was like, this woman is fascinating. Um, <laughs> And That's what my ex-husband told me. When we, to, when we got ready to start dating and we got married, people would ask him, well, how did, I mean, what was it? What is it? He said, she just fascinated me. And it's just the ghetto girl, the hustler, the professional, the mama, the germ folk, the you know, it's it's all around everything, child, everything. Well, I, you know, when I say fascinating, you know, I mean it in the, in the best way possible. Um, oh, of course. Thank you. You, you, you um, like you said, you, you have raised, are raising three children who are on the spectrum. Um, you are a comedian, you're a talk show host, you're an author. Um, talk to me about your family. Oh, my God. So um, I'm 50 years old. I live in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, um, and I have four beautiful children. Andrew is 15. Uh, Brandon is nine. Cameron, my only daughter, is eight. And Daniel, my youngest, is seven. And Brandon, Cameron, and Daniel all have autism spectrum disorders. Um, we used to live down in Texas, and I remember when my son Brandon was diagnosed, uh, I went to the school and said, what's your plan to get my child off special education? And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. I said, wait a minute. You got to have a plan to get my baby off of special education. I want him to do all the things that his peer group is doing. I don't want him to be left behind. And they said, no, mm -mm. we teach the children where they are and then we graduate them. And then after that, you know, if you want to put them in a group home or something, if you can't handle them. And I thought, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. I don't want my child to be um, in a pamper. I don't want him to be um, hiding or afraid to talk to friends. I don't want him to just be passed from grade to grade, not catching up with his peer group. And so I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to move. Um, I'm going to have to go to a state that has um, you know, opportunities for people who have special needs, who have better educational opportunities, and who are really going to catch my children up to their peer group. And so um, my husband and I looked around and we were like, okay, Minnesota has great autism schools and they uh, help children. And when I talked to them about getting my children out of special education and, and engaging them in a normal developing classroom, they said, okay, we can work with you. We can work with you. Okay, let's let's do it. Let's develop a plan. Let's make it happen. And I found so many services here for my children that, um, you know, eventually two years down the road with intense therapy and prayer and pressing and praying and pushing, two of my three children have tested off the spectrum. I didn't even know that was possible. Really? I just know that I kept seeing these white mamas and their autistic children were graduating from college and they were going on to live normal lives. And I thought, well, why is God answering their prayers and not ours? And so what I found through my advocacy work, Chris, is that, you know, our community, the communities of color, not just black people now, we're talking Asian people and Latinos and Native Americans and, and our African community. They absolutely, um, a, a lot of us, we don't want to see and recognize the signs and symptoms of, of our children who have special needs. You know, my son wasn't talking and he was three years old and my mama was like, ain't nothing wrong with that boy, leave that boy alone. 
Leave that child alone. You just want something to be wrong with him. I said, no, he's not looking at me. He's not answering to his name. I don't know what's wrong with this boy. Mm-hmm. I, girl, he's fine. Don't worry about him. He'll talk when he gets ready to talk. Your cousin didn't talk till she was seven. Well, she probably had autism. You should have got her diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so for some reason, um, you know, people in our community, we will say that nothing is wrong because somehow if, if our children have special needs, we think that that reflects on us. Like we weren't doing something right during right. pregnancy or maybe we didn't take the right vitamins or we don't want to be judged at church. And so, you know, we hide or, you know, uh, uh, keep the kid away from other people until they turn out to be teenagers. And then all of a sudden we run to the school and, and want somebody to help them. But early intervention is the key. So these white kids, when they get to school, Chris, they've had three good solid years of therapy. You know, we wait till they get to the school so the school can fix the problem. But what I've learned is you got to have that problem under control by the time you get to kindergarten or it can be too late. By the time my kids got to kindergarten and first grade, they had already had two years of intense therapy. So by the time they were in second and third grade, their test scores were average. They don't get any special education designation. They have come completely off the spectrum with their test scores in their grades. I didn't even know that was possible. And my mm-hmm. children were very autistic. They were still in the pamper. They weren't talking. They weren't looking at me. They couldn't follow simple commands. I remember one time I cried like a baby because they were testing my son and they asked him what his tummy was and he was just spinning around in a circle and flipping his arms i was mm-hmm. like lord him i said my baby don't know where his tummy is this oh wow you know you we talked about you being an author and i want you to tell me a little bit about the books that you've been you've written why you wrote them and i think i know the answer to that but <laughs> talk to me a little bit about why it was so important for you to use that medium as a way to tell your story? Um, I hadn't planned on being an author. I was just gonna use my podcast um, to talk about it and to educate parents. Anytime I was on the radio or TV, you know, I'd use my voice and just keep, I just plan to keep telling my success story over and over again um, so that parents wouldn't lose hope because that's the thing, you think this is it. My child is never gonna graduate from college. My child is never gonna get married. My child is never gonna be independent. He gonna be in a camp for all his life. He's never gonna talk. I didn't see those success stories except for Holly Robinson Pete. Thank God she shared her story to let me know, you know, just keep pressing and keep pushing. Um, and so I figured, you know what, she can't be the only one sharing success stories. So that's what I was just prepared to do. And one day my daughter came home and she said, Mommy, I want white skin, like um all the characters in my books. And I was like, What? And she was reading this book, and oh my God, it was not, it was just uh, the, everybody was whiter than white. They made Fair Fawcett look uh, like Wesley Snipes. They were so white. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going down to the school. I'm about to raise some hell because they need to be having some kids in these books and on this shelf that look like my baby. And when I went down there, that librarian said, Mrs. Brundage, we would find um, a book about a little red dog or a truck or dinosaurs before we found a book um, about a little black girl with autism. And I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna write one. And I'd never written a book before, you know, but who says you can't do it, you know? I went down to uh, Beavis Palm Press as a little boutique publisher and I ain't had nothing but air. They were like, well, where's your manuscript? I ain't got one. Well, where's your treatment? I don't have one of those either. Do you have an illustrator? What's that? We're going to sit in here today, baby, and we're going to write a book. And so we uh, crafted Cameron Goes to School, which is a story about my daughter uh, journeying off to kindergarten on the first day as a little black girl who is nonverbal, but very brave. And then the next year, we wrote a story about my son, Daniel, uh, learning how to talk through music called Daniel Finds His Voice. And then this year, I was supposed to write a book about my son, Brandon. Um, And I told Brandon, you know what, baby, we're not going to do your book this year. Because these critical race theory people are snatching books off the shelf just because they have a black child on the cover. And the one thing that we have always done is we have always put our entire family on the cover of each book. So there's a black mama, there's a black daddy, and there are four black little children and they all look good. It ain't no sad story. Ain't nobody getting shot and killed. It's not a history story. It's an uplifting story about a family overcoming obstacles um, and and things associated with, you know, uh, an autism diagnosis. 
and you know he understood you know i explained it to him that mama didn't want that fight right so we're planning to take a year off from doing the book you know we've done books for two years both of them bestsellers but this year we're just gonna take a break until we went on vacation to texas which is where i'm from and we have an rv uh from uh marcus lamanas at camping world gifted our family an rv and so we would dive yeah honey yeah. <laughs> Ninety-six thousand dollars for a motor coach, and all I gotta do is put gas in it, and he pays for that. Praise the Lord, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Uh, so we down in Texas at an RV park. We at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. We're cooling out, and my son says to me, "Mommy, these people down here love me." I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Mom, they got signs all over the place with my name on it. They are cheering me on. I think they saw us on TV or something." And and we had just finished doing. Uh, Andrew Zimmern's family dinner, that cooking show, right? right? And I said, well, you know, I could understand one person maybe recognizing him or our family, but he said everybody. And so we're riding around the RV park in a golf cart, and my son says, Mom, see, there goes my flag. I, you spot, Mama, look, I spotted my sign. And I was like, you spotted what sign? It was one of those let's go Brandon flags that the Republicans used to insult Joe Biden, President Joe Biden. And my baby said, Mama, do you spot my flag? I said, no, baby, I spot a book. So I got in that uh, <laughs> golf cart, and baby, we took off on two wheels. And I got back to that RV, and I called Beavis Palm Press, and I talked to my publisher, Lily. I said, I know it is the first week of March, but we need a book for April 1st. And she was like, that's not possible. It takes nine weeks to write a book, and you don't have an illustrator, let alone a story. And the one you're telling doesn't fit into a children's book. I said, oh, we're going to make it fit. We're going to call it Brandon Spots a Sign. And we're going to take their slogan. We're going to take that Let's Go Brandon slogan and use it to encourage kids who have autism to do and try new things that they wouldn't normally do or try. And she was like, girl, you are crazy. I said, yeah, I know. She said, but it won't work. It's impossible. I said, well, that's, that's how God works. God works in the impossible. Jesus, you know, didn't feed everybody with a whole truckload of fish. He had a couple of pieces of fish and a couple of pieces of bread, and everybody had something to eat. You know, that's where the miracle comes in. That's where the magic comes in. That's where the testimony comes in. And so we worked really hard, right? Because, you know, we had a story to tell. We had to tell it in a way that kids could understand that wouldn't be offensive or political. Mm -hmm. And I think we did a damn good job. And the book is just going to change lives. And I believe, actually, it's going to be a bestseller. I can see myself on Meet the Press. Right. I can see myself on uh, NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt and his good-looking self uh, talking about my baby's book. That's what, that's right. what my plan is. Great. All right, well, I hope you be okay with being on my Meet the Makers. I'm not as <laughs> handsome as Lester, but... I, I, I mean, you know. <laughs> you know. I'm going you know, this is a dry run. This is my rehearsal dinner for Lester. Oh, okay? okay, okay, okay. All right, well, I am so excited for you, and I can't wait to check out the book. For I'm those excited. of you who are at home and you are just getting to meet this lady, her book is out. Um, it yes. is Autism Awareness Month. Uh, the book has dropped. It is out there. And where can they find it? Where can they find this book? Um, you know, they can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever they buy their books. The book is available everywhere. Right. Um, but you can also uh, go to my website, ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com, and click on books. And all of the books are there um, in one spot. And it'll take you to a link where you can buy them on your um, favorite website where you normally purchase books. So the books are everywhere. And they're really good books. And, and we put our heart and our soul and our love and all the energy that we have um, that we can muster up into these books to encourage other parents um, who look like us um, to also change the narrative. You know, because the thing about autism is, for kids in communities of color, you know, predominantly our teaching structure is white females. Mm -hmm. um, and their perception of how a little black girl interacts and how a young black boy interacts with the classroom may be skewed by news and by things that they were taught and, and things they may or may not have learned about our people. Mm -hmm. And so I found that my kids were getting disciplined in school instead of getting a diagnosis. 
you know, my son jokingly talks about how much trouble he got into for not following instructions. Well, he couldn't. He had autism. You know, they told my daughter she had a bad attitude because she wouldn't talk to her friends. She was nonverbal. So instead of getting a diagnosis, a lot of times our kids get disciplined. And so I want to change the narrative about who has autism and who doesn't. I need some books to be on the shelf about kids uh, who have autism that don't look like the little white boy that they keep parading out there whenever they start talking about Autism Awareness Month. Um, I need, you know, I need them to see some black and brown faces when we start talking about autism. So that 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 could be on, on top of mind for them. Maybe this maybe this child needs a diagnosis. Maybe you know maybe he doesn't need to be disciplined. You know, I, I'm really looking and he's not really giving me a lot of eye contact. Let me talk to his mom. Let me send him to the school counselor to see if there's something that, you know, we can come up with. Let's get a treatment plan. Let's see if we can't, you know, get him into the children's hospital so he can see a developmental pediatrician. You know, guide the parent to the positive instead of, you know, taking them down the road where you got a problem child. I just want to say thank you. Uh, oh. I just want to say thank you that you found us. It's not like we well, found you. You found us. Well, no, let me tell you something. Let me say thank you because I'm going to tell you something right now. You know, a lot of people say, well, I saw this and it changed my life. Or I, I watched this and I was never the same. I'd never had that experience. I've heard people say that. I, I've been in television news for 21 years. I've heard people say that all the time. I saw this story and it changed my life. I watched it. So when you work in TV news, you are very jaded because you deal with death and destruction all day. That's the only job I've ever had. You know, where somebody might see um, something tragic and it, it haunts them and affects them and they lose sleep. That's that's a Tuesday afternoon for me. You know, just, just because of the nature of the business that I've been in. So I've never really seen or watched anything that's really changed my life. And when I saw Fannie Lou Hamer's America, I have not been the same. Let me tell you that. What you did with that documentary is you allow this woman to tell her story in her own voice in a way that resonated with other black women in the struggle like me and inspire and empower and motivate us to greatness that story that she told when she was in that jail and they forced those prison guards forced the inmate to beat her until he was exhausted and then gave the baton to another man to beat her. And she still went out there to register people to vote and fought for freedom. I was like, we're ready to give up the ghost because somebody insulted us on Facebook. We're ready to shut the whole campaign down because somebody didn't like our Twitter post. And this woman got beaten damn near to death. And she still got up and tried to make a difference. How dare I sit here? I got a nine-seater minivan, and my kids got iPads. I got a laundry room and a college degree. How am I, go, how am I not going to make a difference? And so it kicked me into overdrive. It kicked me into 10, okay? And if I was already on 10, it pushed me to 20. I'm looking for ways to help. I'm looking for ways to make a difference. This woman sitting up here got the governor and the mayor and the state senators and everybody else on the run. And she didn't graduate from high school. Here I am, know how to put a PowerPoint together and Zoom and everything else. You mean to tell me I can't hold the governor accountable? I can't hold my legislators accountable? I can't hold my leaders accountable? Hold their feet to the fire to make them do right? Oh, no, sir. If Fannie Lou did it, me too. So I would just tell you, um, watching that, putting that together, I don't know what your intent was, but it's making me a better woman. It's making my community better. It's making my city better. And it's making my state better because I'm doing everything I can to improve the lives of the people around me because of her. That fed into my spirit in a way that I have not been fed in my 50 years of existence. I, I probably watch that every night for a month. Wow. Um, and, and so I, I just have to applaud you and your team and everybody whose hands touched that documentary. And right after that, it was so funny because right after that, USA Today called me and said, mm. um, <laughs> we have selected you for woman of the year. 
um, we want to come by your house and take pictures with you and your kids and do a little news story on you and, and just show the world and put a spotlight on the work that you do in the community. And I was like, yeah, y'all fine. Come on. And I didn't even realize how much I had been touched, but that whole entire USA Today interview, and I'm not sure um, if any of, of the people watching now have seen it, but just go Google it. It was all about Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. I ain't talking about my mama, my grandmama, my husband. I ain't talking about these kids. Baby, it was all about Fannie Lou Hamer and how she changed my life. And it wasn't like I didn't know who Fannie Lou Hamer was. Of course I did. I went to an all-black school. I grew up in Fifth Ward, Texas, home of Mickey Leland, Barbara Jordan, and Sheila Jackson Lee. I had all-black teachers until I was in sixth grade. Yes, sir, I know who Fannie Lou Hamer is. However, I had not heard her voice until your documentary. Well, I thank you for that endorsement. I am so grateful that I am getting to spend time with you and to learn more about your story. And believe me, you know, when I say to you, you earned that Woman of the Year. Um, you are doing amazing work with your family and your podcast company, which we're going to talk more about that on another interview. Um, but uh, I am so inspired by you, and I am thankful that we get to, we've got to meet each other. Uh, through this work uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, I'm gonna link her book in the comment section of this video on YouTube on Facebook and Twitter uh, the USA Today article that she is uh, talking about she really did talk about Vanity Hamer in most of it's the all I talk about I'm telling you they yep. almost called me Fanny Lou the man was talking to me talking about uh, Fitzgerald <laughs> We're gonna link that in the comments too, because you need to you need to know who this woman is. She is an amazing woman, and I am so grateful that we get to spend time with her and get to work with her. And we're gonna find other ways to work with you in the future. Please, please, yes, yes, I gotta yes. I gotta have my hand and toes and and hangnails all up in worldchannel.org because you all are doing some amazing work and I, I just want to be a part of that in any small way that I can. I love the work that you and your team are doing. It's life changing. Um, if I'm impacted by that, you only know because I have a platform. Imagine how many other tens of thousands of people, especially black women, have been touched by that who don't have a platform, who just sitting at home watching it, who just became a better woman because of it. I, I, I know that I am, and, and I'm sure that, that they are too. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for hearing that, and I, let's, let's, let's make connections with them. Uh, I am Chris Hastings. Uh, I go look her up. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have links in the comments, and I will talk to you next time. Uh, this is our Meet the Makers event, special Meet the Makers event. Uh, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon.